Enter the Arcanum has released, putting 24 new cards into the Eternal ecosystem for the Eternal Open coming up next weekend. Let's talk about it. Hello everyone and welcome to EffieCast episode 84 where we're going to talk about the new set Enter the Arcanum and the upcoming Throne Open. Um, I am your host, uh, Draft Open Top 4 competitor Sunnyvale, um, and I am joined as always by my co-host Stormblust. How's it going? Hello, I am not a Draft Open Top 4 competitor, uh, but I am, I am excited to play with some new cards. This set is... In some way, I mean, there's certainly at least one card that's making a ton of waves already, um, both in discussion purposes and on ladder. Uh, but I'm very excited to see how the set's going to impact things, even beyond this one specific card. But we'll get to it. You probably know which card we're talking about. Yeah, probably. And I'd like to point out, you have top board a draft event. And that is true, actually. Top four, your top four <laughs> actually qualified you for Worlds, where mine is that's just true. a half qualification. That's true. I, 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 so. I am a top four draft uh, competitor actually <laughs> yeah this is this is my best uh tournament finish in the last two years and it came with minimal preparation i drafted two times before the event <laughs> i just got you know you know how when you're playing in day two and you just get eliminated because your opponent got super lucky because of x y or z or you got unlucky or something like that well that this past weekend or whenever the draft open was, I just was on the other side of that consistently. <laughs> where I was like, "Wow, I'm getting so lucky," or "Wow, my opponent's getting so unlucky." So that's how that happened. All right. Um. So today we're not going to be talking about draft. We're going to be talking about throne. That's our big focus because there is a draft open on August uh, 26th through 28th. That's next weekend as of recording, eight days from now. Um, and they released 24 new cards. Some of them are pretty spicy leading up to it. Um, so yeah, we're going to try to get you caught up on, uh, expert opinions on how good the cards are and how they might impact Throne. Um, as always, we're just going to be doing this in order of the cards in the client. So if you want to follow along in your eternal client, go ahead. We're going to start with the fire cards, go on to time, etc. Uh, but yes. first, before we go over the new cards from the campaign there's like uh, mini set whatever you call it there's also a, a variety of promos that might be worth discussing as well because they Darewolf is now releasing one new card a week and since the last gift cast has been a number of them and so some of them are worth talking about yeah we usually don't talk about them because our casts are so infrequent nowadays um but these promos are cool like i'm i'm just generally a fan of the fact that there's new eternal content every single week that's just fantastic to me yeah, I like that they're advancing the story if if slowly, but, you know, steady, slowly but steadily. It's pretty nice. Uh, you know, there's been a variety of promos every week that are interesting. You know, the latest one, Miviox Mayhem, is probably trash. It's uh, four Shadow Shadow for a spell. Each unit gets plus two, minus two, and each player discards the top two cards of their deck. It seems overcosted for what it's trying to do, so it's probably trash. Yeah, like, I don't even know what you're supposed to try to do with this. Are you supposed <laughs> to play a deck, an aggressive deck where everything is an X3 so that you, like, clean up your opponent's small units and then get bigger units to attack through or something? That just, like, for four, it's so expensive. It does not seem good. But um, there are, and previous... But, oh, go ahead. I would say, but but the uh, some of the previous promo, though, I think uh, Soul Eater Blade last week, at least an Expedition Soul Eater Blade looks to be incredible, and possibly even throne worthy it's a big lifesteal swing and can give you some card advantage uh soul Eater blade is three shadow shadow for a plus three plus oh fast weapon so you can play it on a unit as a combat trick and when this wielder kills a unit draw it from the void summon the wielder gets lifesteal this turn yeah really interesting card um i feel like generally speaking in eternal weapons are not very good unless you can get them for free or they're caleb's persuader <laughs> um, so, like, this is trying to get to, uh, a, a card that is a little better. I mean, I don't know, like, still weapons are, just don't feel that great. We've had, uh, what's the, Copper Hall Bracers, the Justice one that's plus four, plus oh. Mm -hmm. Like, there's so many 
flying justice units where you can get in and get the get the power from that card um but it just has never seen play and when it has it hasn't been good so maybe this being a fast weapon and providing a lifesteal swing maybe that's good enough but I think the bar is pretty high for weapons to to see play just because of how easy it is to get blown up. Oh, I should mention one other weapon that has been seeing play in Onis is that uh, gold-plated revolver, right? Big plus three, plus three mm. for one power. No, the most common weapon that sees play is the plus one, plus zero overwhelm weapon, Sonny. You see, I don't even think that one sees that much play either, unless you're just... Even then, yeah, like, I feel like they come off of Jisoo... Jishu the two cost unit more than they come off of Chizue. Really? I don't know. I, 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 oh, I mean, in Throne, I, I don't know about Throne. In Expedition, that makes an Expedition you don't have a Jishu, but Chizue is very good. It's a very solid oh, okay. card. I have not been playing Expedition at all. I, I have just found that I've not enjoyed Expedition for whatever reason. Um, fair. Oh, I mean, there is the saga of <laughs> Sunnyvale and Expedition tournaments. I posted this the last time we had an Expedition open. I don't know if you... You out there uh, saw this, <laughs> but um, since the beginning of last season, I have day two every single open except every single expedition open. <laughs> I have not day two a single expedition open, at least not one that I can play. I may have like not been able to play, and and I've not played in a day two of an expedition open, but I've made the day two of every single other open. Um, so. Expedition is definitely my Achilles heel so right Sun now. <laughs> Sunnyvale is not an expedition specialist. Other people <laughs> are expedition specialists, but not Sunnyvale. Yeah, definitely not. I mean, there was, uh, gosh, uh, at risk of having this uh, entire cast being waxing poetic of, like, my own tournament history, <laughs> um, there was that one time where we had, um, like, two throne events maybe a couple months apart uh, maybe several months apart, and the top eight had, like, four of the same eight competitors. <laughs> or between the two top eights, four of the competitors were the same, and I was one of them. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> definitely so, not definitely not an expedition specialist. So the last promo that might be worth discussing is Shoshenka of Coastal, which certainly an expedition is going to be a powerhouse, but, you know, we don't care about that format right now. Uh, Shoshenka of Coastal is seven primal primal for a seven seven bear. Uh, summon, choose two, uh, two, uh, summon, choose twice, play a 3-3 three, three bear, draw a card, or deal five to enemy unit with flying. So basically what the card's designed to do is, at seven cost, it stabilizes you or brings you advantage in whatever direction you need to, right? If you need to go on cards, it'll you cards. If you're low on board, it'll give you a board state. If you there's big flyers, it can kill the big flyers. So it kind of does it all, of course. It costs seven, which is a lot, especially for Throne. Yeah, it definitely is expensive for Throne, and I, I just really like the design on this card. It gives you a lot of choices that you have to, like, navigate when you play the card. Um, it doesn't do anything too broken, which ultimately just might mean that it's not good enough for Throne. Um, but I really like the, the gameplay that this card brings. Um, yeah. As far as Throne goes, I mean, there's, like, kind of starting to be some sort of uh, possibilities with Elysian Ramp. I mean, the Curiox that we got with Contract, that goes well in a ramp deck, but it doesn't really have that many, like, that much good support. This would be the type of card that could be good in a ramp deck, but you know, um, I, you know, I don't think that exists yet. You know, this is the sort of card you'd want to cheat out early, you know, because it's it's powerful, it can print a huge board state, or it can draw you cards, or it can kill things. If only there was a new card from the mini set that would cheat things out, you know, ahead of time. <laughs> All right, speaking of the mini sets, should we start talking about these cards? Yeah, let's, let's jump right into the mini set. Okay. Um, all right, getting it loaded up on my client. Here we go. Let's start off with Catalyze. It's a double fire, two cost spell. Discard a card to draw two cards. Each unit, weapon, or spell drawn this way gets double damage. How do you feel about Catalyze? So, Catalyze is very interesting because there are two cards it compares directly to. Uh, those that would be Strategize and Torgov Wares, right? Strategize and Torgov Wares both draw two cards and then bin one of them. Uh, Strategize puts it on the bottom, where Torgov's Wares puts it in the Void, which is far superior. A Torgov's also gains you two life, which is far superior. Uh, so cat in that respect, Catalyze is significantly worse, because discarding ahead of time is much worse than discarding afterwards, because you if you draw a bad card off Catalyze, you can't then discard it. That being said, though, Catalyze has a number of upsides. 
double damage is an incredibly powerful ability. You know, if you draw like torch and you know, uh, like a four four flying charge, you know, now it has double damage. And you just eight plus six, and you just kill your opponent. Uh, also, it's in fire. You know, Torgaz wears has to mean you have to be playing Elysian factions, and strategize means you have to be playing uh, primal. So if you're not playing primal, you know, you know, like if there's like a stolen scar reanimator deck or something, right? They can't play. Torgaz wears a strategize, you know, or I guess reanimator wouldn't play strategize, but so catalyze has a lot of upside, right? I think overall it's worse, but again, it's in a different faction and it does different things. So I like the card a lot. I think it's a really cool card and should result in some fun, interesting new decks even. Yeah, it is pretty interesting. Um, something about it is that Fire has a lot of these discard enablers, and this is the best one so uh, yet, I think, because you've had cards like Feed the Flames or whatever, where you make two three ones uh, <laughs> in your hand or so, whatever. It's, it's a terrible card. Um, but I've definitely searched through the client for cards like this before, and the fact that this one replaces it with cards from your deck and not just, you know, useless pieces <laughs> um, is, is a big deal. So, yeah, and I saw, like, it, you need to pair it with something, and you need to probably pair it with something outside fire, because I just don't think that fire has uh, good void synergies, generally speaking. So I was playing on ladder earlier today, and uh, someone was playing send a message with Catalyze, so it was... Basically, a four cost opponent sacrifices a unit, opponent discards a card, plus draw two cards out of. Uh, I mean, you spent two cards, but you replace them with uh, Catalyze. Um, so, you, I think you need something like that going on, where you are getting value from the discard in another faction. And um, as far as cards that enable those type of discard synergies, I think this is probably one of the best ones. So, it might not be good yet, but. Somewhere down the line, I think we're going to see this be a powerful enabler for discard strategies. I'm going to have to feed the flame now. Because feed the flame also has double fire uh, cost, <laughs> if I recall correctly, right? For some reason. So feed yeah. the flame is kind of like, it's a two cost, three one, summon, discard a card, draw a three one. Where this is just, you know, two cost, discard a card, draw two. It's just, you don't get a three one in play that turn though, Sunny. So it's, it's a big deal, right? What if you wanted the three one in play? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do, play Yeti Cookmaster as your 3-1? Ridiculous. Yeah, well, okay, this is pretty good with Yeti Cookmaster, right? Yeti Cookmaster <laughs> with double damage is huge, and then uh, you give your Yeti Cookmasters plus 4, plus 0. Not just one of your Yeti Cookmasters, all of your Yeti Cookmasters in play. So, <laughs> watch out, watch out. All right, let's move on to the next one. Rickety Ramcart, uh, 3 cost fire, Grenadine Engine, it's a 4-1. When Rickety Ramcart attacks, play a 1-1 one, one Hookbop with Taunt attacking. So you get a 1-1 one, one, uh, with Taunt attacking. I mean, it's what it says. I, like, you kind of need to think about it for it to make sense. And in Tomb, you play a Hookbot. So uh, I think this card is pretty interesting. It does something that I feel like doesn't really exist yet in the game, which is where, I, I don't know, you just like kind of get some cover for your attacking units. It's a pretty fragile unit at 4-1, um, but it gives itself some cover and it gets some value if it dies immediately by getting a hook bot. Uh, what do you think of this card, Stormblist? Well, I, I see a 3-cost Grenadine that entombs to play a Grenadine, and my eyes become little Tesseracts. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm interested in trying it out. I know I know you might be like, oh, Grenadine line makes 3 grands immediately, and so you can combo it with Tessa right away which is you know correct like what you're saying there hypothetical viewer is absolutely correct that being said i want to try it out because taunt is actually a very cool ability and you know this card survives lightning storm better than granite in line um you know may may maybe it's some sort of like critical mass component of of granite i don't know uh but no i, th I want to try it out i don't think it'll end up being great in tessa but i want to try it out in tessa because i just like tessa so best girl tessa that's all i'm saying I don't think that that's the place for it. I think that its home is going to be in some sort of aggressive deck. Yeah, uh, I mean, where... sure, Sunny wants Mono Fire. I want a dumb three faction <laughs> deck. You know, what's new here? Okay, but real talk, like, you want this in a deck, it, it would be best in a deck where you just, like, can't remove blockers for whatever reason. Some yeah, sort no. of, like, rally deck or something like that where you just have a lot of units and you have a bunch of pump effects, but you don't really have any ways of preventing your opponent from blocking you. Um, so I think that's where this would be best. And even then, I mean, 
Yeah, it's like yeah, a, I a think four one's I, not that big. <laughs> I think Sunday's on the well, four one's actually fairly large on turn three. But anyways, I think Sunday's on the mark here. I do think that it is best in some sort of attacking deck because Taunt is a powerful ability. Uh, if you're attacking, right? if you have like you know three, uh, like three threes, your opponent is like a four four, right? You can Taunt and then they can't block that turn, right? So it's got a lot of uh, utility in Taunt. So. Okay. Yeah. So let's move I don't, on. To... I don't expect this one to see play, and I don't see expect the next one to see play either. Okay. Let's move on quickly to Chizue's masterpiece. Chizue's masterpiece is five fire fire for an eight zero weapon, which is a hilarious stat line. It has Warcry two and summon. The wielder gets quick draw this turn. So this card basically says you better be playing a overwhelm dot deck deck because if you play this on like a three three without overwhelm, the opponent goes. Aha! I will block with a 1-1 one, one Grenadine, and then I'll kill your unit for an easy 2-for-1 with a huge tempo swing. Uh, so, play with Overwhelm, or don't play it at all, and probably don't play it at all. Yeah, I mean, I don't think this card is going to make the cut, but it is something that Eternal doesn't have that much of, and that's, like, really threatening weapons. I've definitely looked through the client for weapons that you know, do a lot of damage. And it's basically Caleb's Persuader and Mantle of <laughs> Justice. And that's basically it. So, I mean, yeah, like, that. this does do something that I've been looking for. It's just not nearly good enough at it. You know, something to put on your uh, passionate stone hammer or something like that. And, I mean, if this cost, you know, four or definitely three, but if it cost four and I was putting it on a passion, passionate stone hammer, I'd be a lot more excited about it. As it is, I... That's so that's so much. Like, why wouldn't you just play a Phoenix? <laughs> yeah, and next up on our cards is a card that I think is a little overrated, actually. Uh, it's All Nighter. All Nighter is one at a time for a fast spell. Put an enemy unit with cost two or less on the bottom of its owner's deck, or create and draw an Apprentice Mage. Uh, I'm not saying it's not hasn't does not have a power level. It's not you know even thrown playable. I just think people are somewhat overrating. I think that. Being able to hit three drops, like with Defiance, is very relevant. Um, not everything costs two, even though people like to pretend it does. And I don't think Apprentice Mage is that powerful of a card, right? The power in All-Nighter lies in its flexibility, where you can do both things. But even still, Apprentice Mage is, is a 2-2 two, two for two that, you know, is not it's not like it does influence like Trailmaker. If they give you a Trailmaker, I'd be like, all in on this card. Um, as is, I just think it's... I think it's it's good, and I think it might see play, but I think people are somewhat overrating it at the moment. Yeah, when I first saw this card, I thought it was really good, but after having some experience with it, I don't. So I, I pretty much agree with you. First, I just want to appreciate like how amazing the flavor of this is. <laughs> Pull an all-nighter, and there's a lot of other cards in the set that are just like school-themed that are pretty funny. Um, so... <laughs> As someone who has been playing uh, Trickshot Ruffian decks <laughs> lately, uh, All Nighter is a problem because I'm usually putting my all my eggs in a basket that costs two or less, um, and uh, it doesn't get stopped by you know the size of the unit or something like that. But you're right, like Apprentice Mage really isn't that exciting. I mean, if you go turn one All Nighter, to turn two Apprentice Mage. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's okay, but there are, like, no other situations in the game where you would want the Apprentice Mage, and if your opponent doesn't have units that cost two or less, it's really not that exciting. So I, I am kind of low on All-Nighter, and in Defiance, you know, which is probably its big comparison, one cost removal spells on small units, Defiance will... Uh, well, first of all, it's three units that cost three or less, but also it will stun a unit that is bigger. So, like, you know, it... it it serves its purpose uh, more effectively when the unit doesn't fall under the condition. So mm -hmm. at first I was super high on this card, but now I think that it might be just some fringe deck on uh, a defensive deck that doesn't have access to Defiance. The the other interesting thing about All Nighter is, of course, as you said, uh, it's time and not justice, right? So if you're not playing justice or you're playing an aggressive deck, right? Defiance is primarily a defensive tool where this can be used. Uh, proactively, um, as well. There's two things. One is that this is a fun chalice card if you want to build a chalice deck because it's a control tool that also uh, gives you a two power unit for chalice. But aside from meme decks, um, this card interesting is that it's better on the draw than the play because on turn 
you know, you your opponent plays a power, you know, if they play a one drop or not, right, you can decide to all nighter it. Or if they play power pass, and you, then you play undepleted power pass, and they can, if they play a two drop, you remove it, and if they don't, you play an apprentice mage. Whereas if you're on the play, you have to either, you know, hope that they play a one drop to decide to remove something, or you know, make your apprentice mage, and then they play their your opponent plays the really scary two drop, and you're like, oh darn, why did I make the apprentice mage? Because if you wait to make the apprentice mage on turn two, then you can't play the apprentice mage, right? So it's kind of interesting that this card, in some aspects, is better on the draw than the play. Yeah, I, if you're on the play, I guess you can be really confident that your opponent's going to play a two drop and go one drop plus all nighter. But I think you're right. Um, let's move on. Arcanum Janitor is the next card. Four costs, zero one. Summon put a card in a void on the bottom of its owner's deck. Arcanum Janitor gets uh, plus attack plus health equal to its cost. Um, so this, I don't think this card is very spectacular. I think people have recognize that it's probably not spectacular, but if you're playing Sentinel Reanimator and you put whatever huge Sentinel with Bond uh, on the bottom of your deck, this thing's going to be absolutely ginormous. Uh, that's the only situation where I can see this card being relevant at all. So, so Sonny, can I tell you about the first game I played on the new set on Throne Ladder? Can I tell you about it? Sure, go ahead. So my opponent goes turn to Spore Folk and mills Arcanum Janitor and... The Witching Hour! And then they followed it up with a Haunting Scream! And then I died immediately. <laughs> that's, so, that's pretty funny. Wait, but you only took 24, it was, right? It was on, like, turn 4. I took an extra, like, damage or 2, and they had, like, an extra unit in play at that point. Okay. So there, there, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a little bit later than turn 3. Uh, but it was very funny. The other combo there is actually Short Hopper where you can short hopper to stick witching hour in the void and not play shadow at all. And by doing short hopper things, you also um, guarantee that witching hour costs as much as it will because it doesn't reduce its cost of the market. Um, so th there's actually some cute things with Arkham of Janitor and witching hour specifically. Um, but it was, it was very funny. I was like, wow, that's a hell of a first game on the new set to play. <laughs> yeah. And, okay. So do you think this has any legs at all in some sort of like Sentinel reanimator deck? Or it's just, it's not good enough. It can't be the Katra for that deck. The, the Katra for that deck? What? <laughs> the really big unit you play on four without having to fetch it out of the void. Uh, I mean, I, I guess in that aspect, you, you like with Katra, I guess. So the thing about Katra, though, is that Katra's, you know, if, if it, Arkham Janitor is say an 8 9 and Katra is an 8 6, the difference is, is that Katra, you know, ramped you four times and lets you play all your expensive stuff forever if arcan janitor also ramped you four times you know then it would be katra but it's it's not katra because it doesn't also the thing is if katra gets removed which is possible right it's just a unit you know katra still wins you the game because it ramps you four times where if arcan janitor is removed it just removed and you have to you know continue playing the game so it's definitely not katra although i like the design i think it will be you know relegated more to the space of fun decks but i don't think that's a bad place to be I think having fun is important, and I don't think that, you know, I think that it's good enough to be fun, and I think that that's fine. I think it's a fine space to be. All right, I think we've spent enough time on this sure. card. Let's talk about Taller, Headmistress. Head mistress. Uh, she's a 6-cost, six 6-6 six, six charge, plus 2 maximum power, and when Taller hits the enemy player, replenish your power. Um, this seems like a pretty cool card. There are a lot of situations in time decks where you're getting swept by, like, Harshul or something, and you really want a charge unit, and Tyler brings that. Um, I, but I still struggle to find a good, like, application for it. What do you think, Stormblast? Yeah, I'm not super high on this card. I mean, I, I know that this is, like, you know, worst case, I mean, I just imagine, like, I play Talir, and I'm like, I block with a Grenadin. Wow, you had a Talir. Uh, you know, like, I block with a 1-1, one -one, especially because... At the moment, one of the most popular decks is a deck playing a bunch of one cost one ones or whatever. Um, you know, it just costs six. It, I mean, it has some evasion, you could say, by having charge, meaning your opponent can't necessarily predict that it's going to happen, or you know, they have to predict it right so you can like surprise them. The surprise factor is relevant because um, you know the opponent could attack with everything, not play a blocker, not have you know if they have to chump, that's not unreasonable either, right? If you're playing against like you know a Kira deck and they have to like chump with their Hosian, you know. You're probably okay with that as with the players in playing Talir, but cost six. I don't know. I think it's 
It's, I mean, Expedition, it's probably pretty good. You can attack with Talir and then play a Shashanko to follow up with. That seems pretty decent. Um, I don't know about Throne, though. Yeah, seems slow for Throne. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about this card. There, like, six just is so much. You better be getting uh, value out of the card if uh, it doesn't, like, get to meaningfully attack. Like, at least with Grodolf Stranger, you get a power that can power up your other plays. All right, um, moving on, Campus Security. Now we're in Justice cards. Costs uh, one single Justice for one three. Uh, it's a Minotaur, Minotaur Soldier, plus two attack while you or Campus Security are wielding a weapon. Pay four to give Campus Security invulnerable to damage and war cry this turn. I actually think this card's pretty interesting. It's got nice stats um nice base stats uh you definitely need to find some weapons that don't suck which as i've discussed already can be difficult but uh you know you could have a one cost three three with additional abilities on top of that yeah i think this card's actually pretty good i wish it was an oni and not a minotaur um but you know we can't have everything um do you remember back in like beta like closed beta there was an o3 rare for one fire that had plus three while wielding a weapon they just kind of reprinted that, but gave it, like, significant upsides. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's like Arms Dealer or something, right? Yeah, I don't remember the name of it, but it was it was a 1 and a Fire for an O3 that had plus 3 while itself was wielding a weapon. And this has, you know, the same thing where it becomes a, a plus, it gets 3 attack, 3 health if it's, if it's wielding a weapon. But this also has, while well, you're wielding a weapon, and it has 1 attack normally, and it also can get invulnerable and Warcry, which is... Not irrelevant. I mean, like, you know, in, I mean, I guess Expedition went back there because it's just easy to make the synergy is, you know, you play this, you play a Chizuway on three, you, you attack with a four, three overwhelm that can become invulnerable in the future. And if the opponent kills it, which they're going to want to because it's a really powerful tempo uh, advan advantage otherwise, is you, you draw a card off of it. So, you know, I think the cards, I think it's fine. I think it's good. It's one, three for one. That's not a terrible stat line when you have upside of becoming a three, three or, you know, getting invulnerable. Yeah. Um, Especially with something like Lunar Claw, which often eats three threes and then sticks around for a little while. Um, yeah. That could be helpful. But I, I think it's really going to come down to finding weapons that are not embarrassing to play. Um, and like, yeah, in like Expedition, that might be better. But like right now in Throne, I just don't see that. Yeah, I'm not sure about Throne. I think Expedition, it's, it's far more likely. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Strict Professor is three and a Justice for a 3-2 Mage. Uh, Strict Professor... Uh, when Strict Professor attacks, play Better Than Ever. And Better Than Ever is the zero-cost justice spell that says each unit you play this turn gets a random battle skill. And it also has Summon. You may silence up to two enemy units that cost two or less. So uh, the flavor is is that, you know, you play Strict Professor, Strict Professor will silence the young students because the young students are represented by costing cheaply. And then Strict Professor instructs your students by attacking and gives them, you know, special skills and learning knowledge by playing better than ever and giving any future student you play abilities. So it's really cool flavor um, and surprisingly powerful, probably. As a Kira player, I do not want to see this. <laughs> this will destroy me. Um, but I don't think it's very good. Like, you have to get value out of the Silence Bits card to be any good, right? And in that case, why not just play Valken Forcer, right? <laughs> because Valken Forcer is a 3-3, three, three, so it can block better, and it flies. And the chance that you're going to... Uh, silence two cards is uh i think less likely than the chance that you're going to want to silence something that costs more than more yeah. than two and I, I guess i guess the other relevant thing there is that you might silence two cards but are they two relevant cards like you know you can silence like a a two cost unit which which would be relevant but is your other silence target like a one one with charge or overwhelm from dinosaur nest aha you got the value you silenced two things but did you really silence two <laughs> things did you really get the full value uh i mean Yes, one thing is probably still fine, though. I think the thing that makes Strict Professor less appealing is the same reason that I think All Nighter is somewhat less appealing, is that I just think that restricting to two cost or less is relevant, right? We, we've seen before, right? Isn't Kayana, uh, the two, three, three Elysian 2-5, doesn't that have silence two cost or less? Um, and that yeah. always was a little rough because, as it turns out, things cost three, <laughs> Yeah, I forgot about that card. I mean, like, I thought it was going to be pretty good, but um, it just hasn't ended up being very relevant at all. 
So, okay, we're going to move on to a another card, uh, one in a primal for volatile reaction. It is a spell, a very cheap spell, and it deals four damage to enemy unit and four damage to yourself or one of your units. Uh, Sunny, what do you think about this card? I think it's pretty bad. I don't know that we even have to talk about it much more. It's like a bad combust, um, and there are plenty of removal options where I don't think you need to play volatile reaction. So, so I have some things I want to say about. It. First of all, I see I see a one cost primal card, a spell that targets one of my units, and my eyes become little Kiras. Um, oh God! Yeah, if <laughs> you, you can want trigger Hosian Kira. with it. I can trigger Hosian with it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, but importantly, uh, I think this card is. It's not good, but I do think it is playable in a very specific uh, way. And the way I think it's playable is if you are not playing a fire deck, a fire primal deck, potentially even fire uh, primal shadow, I think Volatile Reaction is a very solid one of in a lot of primal decks. Right? It, it, in Expedition, it might be more so with fire, but in Throne, you've got Torch. And, you know, why would you play this over Torch? Uh, but, you know, if you're not playing fire... If you're playing a primal deck as a one of, I think this is a very solid one of. I don't know if this will catch on because partly because I don't know if it's actually a good hypothesis, but I think this is a very good one of. Um, two of it, you know, dealing eight damage to yourself, that's gonna hurt. But dealing four damage to yourself is not the worst thing ever, especially when it comes with a big tempo advantage of killing a thing for one cost. Right. The problem with Zolta Conclave in a lot of ways is that if you play two of them, you've dealt four damage. It's like, oh god, that's a lot of damage actually. But Zolta Conclave doesn't give you a tempo advantage. This does. And I think that you never want to risk playing two of it because dealing eight damage yourself will probably kill you versus aggro. But I think as a one of, I think this could be a very solid one of. Yeah, you might be right. Uh, God. The strange... And the thing is, you know that I... If, you've been, if you're a long-time listener, you know that I do not like one ofs in Eternal. I'm a big fan of not playing one ofs. I think this is like the one situation where I'm like, here's a one of of a removal spell, and I think it could be correct in Primal Dex. It plays as a singular copy. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> like, if you're playing some sort of Skycrack aggro or Yetis or something, maybe it's better than the 4th or 5th or th first prom Permafrost or whatever. Um, yeah, gosh. I <laughs> Maybe. Maybe maybe in small quantities, but boy, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's definitely the weirdest take I have for the set, but I... I, I... Yeah, yeah, you may have convinced me. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's move on to it to a, yeah. to a another card that is very interesting. Um, it is Lethrai Marauder. It is two and a primal for a three one overwhelm elf, which is relevant. Summon. You may discard a card to play a two one elf. Blood Hunt, which is a spell that gives killer to a unit and scout, so you can give killer to a different unit or the Marauder itself. Or Form Bend, which transforms a unit or relic into an elemental with its uh, equal to its stats equal to its cost. Uh, so this card is interesting on a meta perspective because it indicates that hopefully that there might be a, a a cycle in the future of two cost units in each faction that summon discard a card to do three things. Right? We have Styra's Eyes two sets ago. We have Left My Marauder today, uh, and maybe in like you know two mini sets from now we'll get a time one. Two mini sets from now we'll get a fire one, and then we'll get a shadow one. Uh, it'd be kind of neat. Uh, but Sunny, what do you think of Left My Marauder and its flexibility? Yeah, I think this card's really good, um, especially being in Primal, uh, uh, which is a faction that, well, does it take advantage? I don't know. It's it's like, can be played in a film deck where you get to really take advantage of things that you want to discard. And then being able to play a 3-1 and a 2-1 for uh, 2 power, that seems pretty good to me, um, even if you have to discard a card for it. It's just like such a huge tempo swing if you play it on turn 2. If you, if you play turn 1, you know, some unit, whatever... And then turn to this, okay, so turn one, like, uh, vines, right? Dark water vines, and turn to this. Um, you're enabling your discard deck while putting a lot of pressure on board. Um, and I think that's really powerful. The other thing is, I think it could be good in some sort of, like, control deck, just as a flexible uh, answer to things. That form bend, especially in Throne, I think is surprisingly good. Like, if you're playing against Combray Relics, and you turn their Relic into a 2-2, two -two, that's, like, you know, that's it's basically as good as dead. <laughs> um, or if you're playing against, uh, you know, any deck that leads off with the initiative sands or, or like a high value card, form bending it can be a big deal. But you have to have the cards to be able to do that. You can't just discard cards willy-nilly, right? Uh, you have to have 
or is it nilly willy i whatever uh, you have to have like some way to fuel this card but i do think that it's really good just because of how much um how much you can do with it for just two power this card is the probably this this card that misses Jotun hurler the most um like, a lot of other cards that miss you on Hurler are still roughly as good. Like, Crafty Occultus is still very good. Merchants are obviously still insane. Uh, but this card would absolutely love having a Jotun Hurler. Um, you know, but th this card, I think... I think this card is... Um, so, last time we saw this in Styre's Eyes, I made probably one of the worst evaluations in the spoiler season that I've ever made, which is, the, you know, the greatest Justice card we'll see played every single Justice deck and was absolutely absurd. And Styre's Eyes was not that. Uh, well, you know, it's it's good. No, I'm not yeah, saying okay. Styre's Eyes is bad. I, I'm saying that it is nowhere near the greatest Justice card of all time, which is basically what I was proliferating it as. Honestly, I'm pretty down on Styre's Eyes for the most part. I don't think it's a four of in a lot of decks. I think it's like a good two of. Because um, if you ever draw two Styre's Eyes, you feel really bad. <laughs> Left Arm Marauder, though, is not Cyrus as it is very different because they have different flexibility. Um, you know, I'm not sure about it in a control deck because I don't know if control decks want a two for one themselves, uh, even for tempo purposes, because, it, you know, the three one body is not as relevant in a control deck. You know, if you give it killer, you could open yourself up to being two for one, which is also not what you want to be in a control deck. Um, also, you're two for one yourselves no matter what, but you could have a, a tempo two for one where they, you know, play like a char or something to get rid of it on the killer attack um i don't know about this card anymore the more the more i've thought about it i was like it's the you know everyone's like it's insane it's got a better anchoring mode than the styre's eyes and now i'm like i don't know i think it's i think it's still powerful i'm just unsure about where it ends up and i'm not willing to make a uh, evaluation as to where i think it'll go or how far it'll see play well i do think the blood hunt the one that gives killer is the worst mode on it um, but, but Sunny, it's a it's a targeting spell. You can play on a Hosian, <laughs> and then you can trigger the Hosian, and you can attack for six five life steal. It's a Kira card, Sunny. <laughs> yeah, turning the card in my hand into a Justice Sigil in play, I guess. And the killer effect. Yeah. Um. I mean, okay. So while we're on the Kira train, you could play uh, Siditi and get the curse, and then play <laughs> Form Bend on it to make it a five five that can then attack if it was wow. in play at the beginning of the turn. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, incredible. No. But you don't, no, no, <laughs> the better thing you do with the CD thing is why would you turn the curse and then you could play Form Bend and turn the curse into an actual unit? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay, okay. I think yeah. you meant turn the CD into an attack for a killer. No! Okay, okay. <laughs> the the CD curse costs five. Yeah, I mean, I think that people are going to figure out a way to make this card good. And like, like Stairs Eye, it might not be the best primal card ever, but I think it's going to have. A pretty big role to play. I think it is likely going to see more play than Styre's Eyes. Um, but again, I don't want to make too much of a judgment because I definitely blew it last time on this on a card like this. So, okay. Uh, next card on the list is Gravity Field. It is four primal primal for a relic. It's a very interesting relic. Your most recently played unit has plus two, plus two, and flying. And then also another effect, if primal primal. When Gravity Field goes to the void, the top unit of your deck gets flying. So it either goes to the void by either being destroyed after being in play, or if you discard it. So you can either use it for discard value for relatively minor value, or this kind of somewhat reasonable effect of you know giving every unit a uh, what's that site endless steps right that gives the most recently played unit plus three plus three. Yeah, you know, this is I'm... this is this is like endless steps, but it's more permanent because the opponent can't kill it as easily, and also it gives things flying. But it is more expensive. So Sunny, what do you think about Gravity Field? Yeah, I was going to say, like, going endless steps into this if your unit stays alive. That's, like, kind of interesting. Um, I do think it's, like, really expensive. It's just not an efficient card. Its effect is pretty good, but I think it's just too clunky. Like, you could be playing something like Mantle of Justice on a unit, um, and instead you're playing Gravity Field, which has, you know, obviously a more persistent effect, less prone to bl being blown out. But... Just the impact you get on the board, the turn that you play it, is nowhere near that of, of you know, other four-cost things that help a unit like Mantle of Justice or Caleb's Persuader. I think my issue with the card is that I think that uh, Relic Destruction is going to be very common at the moment, and we'll get to why uh, later, and you guys all know why. Um, but I think that because Relic Destruction is going to be pretty common, you know, I don't think this card is going to see too much play at the moment until Relic's 
destruction stops being so uh, meta necessary. Yeah. Because, okay. because, sorry, just to finish that thought, because it is a singular relic, right? It's not like you're playing seven relics where this is your seventh relic, and then the opponent can only kill one of them. In a deck that's playing Gravity Field, it's likely your only relic. So then the relic destruction that is otherwise turned off in the opponent's deck has, suddenly has a place. Um, you're t making their cards better than they could be otherwise. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to Event Horizon. Uh, this is a shadow spell. It costs two. It has Unleash, Sacrifice a Relic to draw two cards. Notably, this isn't a fast spell. So um, kind of a Devour with Unleash, but for Relics. Um, I think that Event Horizon is going to be good in uh, Relic-based decks that have one of this in the market that need to refuel late game. Um, and that's about it. So like maybe in rats as a one of in the market, and I don't really see a place for this in other places because you just don't get relics for free very often. What do you think of Event Horizon? I mean, I think the card's really cool. I think the card has a decent power level, uh, you know, Devour for Relics. It Certainly, I think as time goes on, this card will just get better and better. Um, someday it might even get nerfed if, you know, if there's like a three-year period or whatever where the card becomes goes off the charts. Uh, I don't think it's exceptionally likely, but it, you know it's not out of the it's not out of the question in a couple years. Um, the other thing about it is you know th there's some fun meme opportunities with Bottled Storm and Waystone Gate where you know you can pay five to either or three plus two rather to make an eight eight and draw two or just draw five and that seems like a fun strategy to try out. So I'm gonna probably play that at least once or twice on ladder because that sounds like fun. Um, I think I think there could be a place for this card. Maybe not at the moment because of relic destruction being necessary, but. Um, I think the card's fine. I love the I love the card actually. I think the card's really cool. Um, big fan of the card. It's like I like that's an unleash card that's dated by the fact that you have to have the relics, so you can't just unleash it twenty times unless you have twenty relics. Yeah, and like I said earlier, you don't get relics for free, so it really is a big cost. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the next card we have is Mischievous Student, a two shadow shadow for a one three unit with ambush, which is good. And it is summoned. You may swap a unit's power and toughness. So you can swap its own attack and health and make it a uh, ambushing 3-1 to block things, which is nice. Or you can do shenanigans like kill an Aurelian merchant or, I don't know, a host of other things. Uh, probably just expedition only. That's my guess. What do you think, Sonny? Yeah, it seems worse than Twisted Farmer, um, which is a very powerful card. But I just don't see a situation where you'd play this over Twisted Farmer. Or... Uh, I mean, maybe if, like, uh, ABCDFG is, or whatever that deck is called, is everywhere, and you have Brodies and uh, Dairy Capains that you can pick off for free, maybe that yeah. this would be preferable to that. But I think, generally speaking, uh, Twisted Farm is a lot better. Okay, next card is a card that's somewhat worth discussing. This is Collision Course. This is... Uh, three fire justice for an inscribed spell. So this is uh, we have four multi-faction inscribed cards that join Exodus to create a you know a not necessarily a cycle but a collection of five dual faction cards. You know each having only overlaps on you know two sides or whatever uh, equally balanced that is. Uh, so we have a three cost spell that says give a unit plus three plus three taunt and overwhelm. Uh, so I think this card's actually pretty good. It's got inscribed. I mean, if it didn't have inscribed, it would be terrible. But it does have inscribed, which means that, you know, at worst, it's like a Shugo standard, you know. And then at best, it helps remove things, push through damage, triggers Kira. Um, <laughs> so, Sonny, what do you think about Collision Course? Yeah, I think this card's really good. Um, having the flexibility of being a power or a obviously clunky removal spell. But, I mean, if you're playing an aggressive deck, a lot of the times that your opponent uh, doesn't have the... Well, I mean, like, they, if they take damage and lose their unit, like, that's pretty bad. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Or, like, you know, if you force uh, one your opponent's big blocker to trade with one of your smaller units, that's that's a really good thing to have in, uh, in an aggro deck. So I like this card a lot. I think that with the Inscribe, you're going to have to play a deck that maybe, like, tops out a little higher, like maybe you're trying to get to Phoenix, and it gives you the uh, power flexibility to get to Phoenix while also being a pretty good card um, just like when you're on the aggro plan. So yeah, I think this card's good. Honestly, if you top out at 4, uh, I think Inscribe is probably playable. Like, you yeah. don't want... Like, if you, like, like, playing more than 25 power, especially when it's relatively free, as in, like, you, you still have a card that's 
not unreasonable to play is is good because you you know power is really good to have and when you can sort of cheat the system and that's what Jarl is trying to give us is the ability to play more than 25 power while still letting eternal players be as greedy as they want to be <laughs> yeah well i mean in this case greed is good right mm -hmm. there was that draft format where we all played 15 power in our decks mm -hmm. and we would refuse to play more the first one was inscribed <laughs> so yeah, this card, I think this is going to see a fair amount of play, certainly in Expedition, but uh, maybe in multi-faction aggro decks in Throne, too. The next, so card, next card is a Justice Pri uh, blah, 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 Justice Time Relic, cost three Arcanum cor Corridors. When you play a unit, it is invulnerable to damage until the start of your next turn. Summon play slow. Um, it's an interesting card. I think that slow is like... A really interesting effect now that we don't have as much market access as you know we've had in the past but i don't think this run really does enough it's like good for blocking and uh yeah i mean it's, it's just not proactive enough i wish it cost two i mean yes if a card was better sunny it'd be better um <laughs> <laughs> or if it had inscribed if it hadn't i mean maybe but yeah it's just it's it's nice to have more relics that do things because that's sort of what sentinels want right if you're playing like a volk deck you really want a relic that does a thing that you can sack off um but costing three is just it's a lot even if you get a slow um like amphitheater gives you a slow but it also replenishes your power or gives you a plus two plus two or whatever its other ability is um now suddenly there's a combo you can play this card, and then you can play Socrato and play a one cost four or five that doesn't die. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, for a turn. <laughs> for one turn, exactly. Now you're getting it. Now you're thinking with portals. Okay. Uh, that, that's all. Yeah, let's go on to the next card. Pretty exciting one. Celestial Discovery, three cost, fast spell in time and primal. Uh, draw two cards. If you have two relics, draw two of the top four cards of your deck instead. Put the rest on the bottom. I've tried playing this card, and uh, certainly on surface level, it looks pretty good. It's like a better Wisdom of the Elders for a Legion decks. But it turns out it's actually pretty hard to get two relics into play that you care about, <laughs> was why I've discovered. Even when playing Rats, like I was not getting the look at the top four and choose two cards. But obviously, if you can get to that point, this is an extremely powerful draw spell. If you were um, playing Rats and not getting two relics in play, I... Honestly, I think you're building your Wrath deck wrong, probably. That being said, I, I don't even think... You, now, mind you, if you've played Display of Menace, you know how powerful drawing 204 is compared to just drawing 2. Like, that Display of Menace feels like cheating every time you play it for its cheat mode. Um, that being said, though, Celestial Discovery, at its base, its, you know, its baseline, is Wizard of the Elders, 5 through 8, in, in some sort of, you know, Elysian control deck. Does it really need to be more than that? I mean, like, it's just a solid card by itself, you know? Or an Elysian deck that's playing more time focus that wants to draw two, right? If you're playing like a heavy all head deck or something, you know, it's a, it only costs one primal rather than two. I don't know. I think the card's perfectly good without its relic mode. And with its relic mode, it's it's great. So at the moment, it seems unlikely that the relic mode's going to be necessary um, or possible. But I think the card's the card's good. I think it's good, solid. Relic mode makes it great. Doesn't need it, but it's great otherwise. Yeah, if you're playing some sort of like tradition deck that's playing three factions, it's probably better than Wisdom of the Elders because it's easier to get primal time than it is to get double primal, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I also feel like the decks that want Wisdom of the Elders are rarely timed, so that might be a challenge for it. Um, or are decks that want Wisdom of the Elders rarely timed because Wisdom of the Elders was too primal, right? Maybe it's, you know, again, you're building a three faction deck, whatever, right? This is. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I just think that this is going to see more play in the three faction decks, um, and I, I don't really think this is going to see you play alongside Wisdom of the Elders, especially in Throne. I don't think you have that type of time <laughs> to have like that many draw twos in your deck. But yeah, this is a good card. It'll see play in the right situations. Um, yeah, that's where so I am with it. Our next card is, I mean, this is the, I mean, our next card is Containment Sphere, one time shadow for an inscribed relic. So it's very cheap relic, and it also doesn't scribe. Uh, units can't leave voids. Summon the enemy player discards the top unit of your de of their deck. So this set's basically just like the batteries mini set of all time, right? Like it's just nothing but cards <laughs> the batteries loves. I guess so. This card doesn't seem very good to me. Maybe if you are 
having difficulty finding void hate like out of your market or something, this could fill that role and you really need to hate opposing voids. But I mean, you know, like uh, what's the card that's, isn't there a card that says like embargo officer or something? Cards yeah. can't leave markets or voids or something like that. And it costs one and it's a unit. So like it can attack when it has nothing else to do. Um, like that card exists and it sees zero play. So even so, this, though this has inscribe, I just don't see this really seeing play. So notably, again, this has inscribe, which automatically makes it, you know, interesting. Because um, inscribe is great if you don't know. Uh, it is insanely powerful ability, especially on a multi-faction card. Uh, in a rat deck, for instance, this is a way to cheat on playing more than 25 power uh, while, you know, still playing a relic. It's a one-cost relic even. That's, you know, about as cheap as you can get. Um, units can't leave voids is, is a funny hate text because the most common thing leaving voids at the moment are power cards. So it doesn't really mean hate on Kotcher that well. Um, that being said, it's also actually surprisingly really good in uh, Totas, uh, playing the Tota combo deck. If, in case you don't know, the Tota combo deck uh, cheering section says, whenever a card is discarded, make a Tota, and this discards a card and is a relic, Right, the Dota deck also wants some sort of uh, relic critical mass. So this card discards a card to make a Tota, is a relic, is inscribe, is fixing. Um, you know, works with uh, like you know, Event Horizon is just a cheap relic. Um, I think the card, I think the card's fine. I think it'll do what it needs to do. It's a very niche card, but it is niches. It'll be the best card you want. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I mean, it costs one and has inscribed, so <laughs> really low floor on it. Can only be so or, bad. Sorry, really high floor on it. Relatively <laughs> high floor on it. Okay, uh, next card, Mila, Exchange Student. Four cost, uh, Huru card, single justice, single primal. It's a 1-1 one, one hero. Has inscribe, has summon, invoke, justice primal. When you play a spell, Mila gets plus three, plus three this turn. So obviously has value as being a multi-faction inscribe card, but I think this is like really bad. <laughs> I, I like the card a lot actually. This was this is one of the cards that I was kind of excited for when I saw it spoiled as far as the set goes. I just think it's a a, a a solid role player to help just you know make decks function. Uh, like a control deck can you know play it for fixing slash you know extra power, um, and then if they don't need the power, they can just play it to get a little bit of value and i think that that's that thing that's pretty good also you know it, it's a it's a makes a spell it works with spells is this a kira card it fixes oh my god it's kira uh everything's kira sunny um but I, no, okay so so for seriousness and kira purposes i don't think this would be a four of an akira deck i think you could play this as a two of an akira deck to try to play more than 25 power it's you know you do have etchings for that as well um but you can never have too much power in your deck in all honesty um, but I don't think it's be like a four over here. I think this could be a two of. Otherwise, I think this could be a very solid little control inscribe invoke card that just gives you a little bit of value, which just maybe was what you need. I think it's a solid role player for what it needs to do. It, the problem is it's so inefficient. Four to play a one one. That's such a huge tempo loss. I guess it does have inscribe, but I don't know. I just feel like this would be much better if it was a power. In most cases, like I would rather just have a power that provides both influence, can maybe be undepleted sometimes, because, like, I just have a really hard time uh, seeing getting value out of playing this for its cost. I mean, I mean, I already I already played it in Kira. I already played the two. I, oh, I, I was God. trying to get the two of in Kira, and I got I got a, uh, like, like ring through or whatever, the two-cost justice spell that gives the thing plus three, plus three, the two-cost finest hour. And I was like, yeah, I got a finest hour off of it. It was great. Uh, let's so, move on, though. Okay, so, like, in Kira specifically, and I've been messing around with Kira a lot, as I always do, <laughs> um, I, I think that I've been playing a... What's the card? Stormhalt Plating. I've just been playing Stormhalt Plating in Kira, because, oh, like, sometimes yeah. against aggro, you actually want the extra health. It's armor, whatever. And uh, you can ramp, like, occasionally in Kira, you just ramp really quickly, and then you get a Stormhalt Plating out, and it does a lot of damage. So, like... I think that has a much higher upside than something like this. Uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I hate that. I, I, I don't get to eight very often unless I'm losing. Um, right, like seven, you get to very, you get seven a lot, but like I feel like if I get to eight, I'm either like about to win or I'm like super dead, and it's like not really close to being either. either. Or 
you know, I'm like either super ahead and where I don't need a plating, or I'm like super dead and plating's not really going to get me back in either way. Um, but I don't want to make this the Kira show as much as the funny thing is me, me and Sunny have both landed on just like really liking Kira. So we could just make this the Kira show, but let's not make it a Kira show. Uh, so let's <laughs> move on to uh, the next card is a Feln card. Uh, Feln got a good card this set. I know it's crazy to think that Feln could get something good. Um, this is four Primal Shadow for a 3-3 three, three Direwood Pack Wolf. Uh, it has it has the text of whenever another unit dies, it gets plus one, plus one, which is whatever. But it has the more relevant text of Aegis, Deadly, and Inscribe, which is three very good words. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how important the Deadly is, but this is a really good... Um... This is a really good insurance against a sweeper again in a in a felon aggro deck, and it also has inscribe like <laughs> that like that just that that's good. <laughs> We've already talked about how inscribe gives you a really high floor, and the fact that you know you can play this after you've gone wide with a felon deck, and uh, if they play a sweeper, all of a sudden they're facing down some gigantic unit. That's also a huge deal. So, yeah, I think this card's really good. I don't know about the Deadly on it, but so I think, it's really powerful. So, I'm, I'm, I think the Deadly is far more important than you might think. Uh, why, why didn't you like Mila? Well, Mila's a 1-1, one, one, right? Mila's sometimes a 4-4 four, four in the future, but, like, on the turn you play, Mila's a 1-1. One, one. And on turn 4, especially if you're on the draw, your opponent could be playing a 5-6 or a giant unit, right? They could be playing something really big. And Mila doesn't block big things, or even medium-sized things, like 4-4s. Four but you know what does block big things or medium-sized things on turn four? Deadly. You know what also won't die very easily because it has Aegis? Aegis things. <laughs> so I think, I think Aegis and Deadly is a very good combination on a card like this that is somewhat over for its effect that also has Inscribe. Because again, on turn four, you can block their big thing with your Deadly unit, which is going to be relevant more often than you might think. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's good to have Deadly on it. I guess so. Like, if you're not against a deck that's playing sweepers, maybe they're playing really big units, in which case the Deadly is relevant. Yeah, okay, fair enough. In any case, I think this deck's, this card is pretty good, especially for a Felon aggro deck. Okay, so let's move on to what is probably the uh, single most important card uh, in the entire mini set. This is the Creation Project. For three, fire, time, justice, you get a relic that has... Your units have plus one, plus one, and at the start of your turn, the top card of your deck gets warp this turn. Uh, Sonny, what do you think about the creation project? I don't like this card. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is, it's really good. It's really good. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen all sorts of things that are questionable that goes around creation product, project that I've died to. Like, I, someone was playing, I think it was someone on TBC, was playing a five-faction deck with the Creation Project, and I got absolutely destroyed by it. Um, someone it was, was playing... Sleffer. Sounds like a Sleffer move. I, I've definitely lost to Sleffer a bunch, but I don't think it was Sleffer this time. Um, and then uh, I, people are playing Granadin Rescue with this card, and Granadin Rescue, just like, it's not a thrown card. Um, but I've died to it just because this card is so ridiculously powerful. It, like, as long as you're doing other things, it, it's really good. <laughs> I don't know what to say. So obviously you can play it in a deck that has a lot of small units that it pumps, and then it just, like, gains fuel for them, uh, for the rest of the game. Or you can be playing it in a deck that's, like, controlling and, uh, just gives you more fuel. Like, if you're ramping, you have this, and then you get to play an extra card every turn. It's just so absurdly powerful. I mean, if there was a card to be uh, wary of this coming throne open, I would say it's this card. And whether that be from coming from aggressive strategies or control strategies, either way, you need to be prepared to face decks that have the creation project in it. Yeah, the creation project is 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 a completely absurd. I mean, it's Xenon Obelisk for one less that also gives you a card every turn. Um that's just nuts. That That is just absolutely bonkers value efficiency as well for a Relic. Um, and, and the thing is, there, there's so many ways to play it, as Sunny said, right? You can play this sort of aggro, abundance style strategy. By the way, the reason for Grenadine Rescue is abundance, because it pumps up abundance by three. Um, whereas a card like Kado would only pump it by two, or, you know, Power Cell only pumps it by two. Um, so that's why they're playing Grenadine. I don't necessarily agree with Grenadine Rescue, because I think by itself, Grenadine Rescue is pretty bad. 
I'd rather just play a different card. There has to be something better than Greta and Rescue. Uh, but that's the logic there. Um, yeah, I mean, you can play you can play this sort of very aggressive one drop strategy with Creation Project. You can play Creation Project with mid range stuff, playing Desert Marshals and uh, Valkyrie Enforcers, right? With maybe Pride Leader or something to counter the Creation Project or Varbuck. The the funny thing is, is that the, the best ways to answer the Creation Project are decks that are also going to play the Creation Project, <laughs> which is like, uh uh, you know, like, Varbuck's a great answer for Creation Project, but it's also a deck that's kind of play Creation Project. Then you also have, like, the, you know, you, you have the Hate Bears deck that's playing Dean's Chamber, Suppressor, Volk, Tokos, and, like, Bellax, you know? Uh, you know, because if you play Dean's Chamber, it's suddenly very hard to get rid of the Creation Project. <laughs> um, you know, then you can, you know, get a lot of value that way. You know, there's a lot of ways to build creation project because it is such a powerful card that's also not niche right you know regardless of how powerful like let's say containment sphere is in the tier zero deck of all time right that's in one deck right there's not going to be two tier zero decks playing containment sphere but there could be like three or four tier zero decks playing creation project i mean not only be tier zero be tiers one but like you know there's a variety of different decks that have completely different game plans that would all play the creation project and so the card is just completely absurd yeah, it is. I've been trying to brainstorm ways of actually fighting against creation projects that are effective. I mean, you know, all of your Relic Hate cards are options here. You mentioned Pride Leader. I just don't think that Pride Leader is, like, good enough in other situations uh, to be I mean, great against the fine. creation Pride project. Is good, but... Yeah, but it also comes down a turn later than cre the creation project. I know, so if issue. you're on the draw, you could be in a lot of trouble. I know, but uh, this issue is that Creation Project costs three. It doesn't even cost four. Like, it's not just the novel, it costs cheap. I mean, uh, it's just it's just insane. I mean, the the, the funniest answer is Reappropriator, because you just yeah. build a Creation Project and put a region unit into play, which is hard for Creation Project decks to deal with, except that the Creation Project could be the aggro one, which can't deal with it, or it could be the Silence one, which immediately deals with it. Yeah, and I mean... Like, or it could be the Dean playing... Chamber... It could if also be playing... the, the suppressor one, which would stop the reappropriator entirely because it stops summon effects. Yeah, if, you, if you're playing reappropriator, like, uh, you're not playing the creation project, most likely. <laughs> so, like, that's also a problem. That's a downside. I think the, the best thing to do against creation project decks, generally speaking, is end of an era. Yeah, um, that's so like it. that's that's a big card, but like that costs five. That costs five, and you can't effectively ramp to it. Like all the ramp cards die to end of an era, so you can't make that core part of your strategy. And then if your opponent's playing cards that cost more than three, you're in a lot of trouble. But I mean, in Throne, there, I mean, end of an era is a really really potent card in Throne. So I, I think that's the I, best I, way. The other way that like strikes me as being pretty good. Is that time card that costs one and kills an attachment that costs four or less or something um, that hasn't scribed? Oh yeah, yeah, dismantle. Yeah. yeah. So like those, those are the two cards that are I'm thinking are like these are probably good ways of dealing with it. Other things like I've I've been trying to play Skycrag and the options for Skycrag just aren't very good. Like maybe you have uh, meltdown out of the site, the the Garden of Omens. Uh, is that right? Garden. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so like. That's a pretty good card, but it's not, like, it's really bad against Swarms of Units. Or I was playing Oni Insider, and that's just way too expensive. Um, what else was I trying? Oh, I was playing the the Elf from earlier in the set with Form Bend, and it's just not efficient enough. So, like, it, like, especially against a deck that wants to have a lot of units. So, like, I've been really struggling to find good ways of answering the creation project outside of basically the two cards that i mentioned before <laughs> yeah i mean it, 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 it's not even even cost so you can't play the one cost two one that kills even things which would be a good answer if it could kill it uh creation project also stacks really well with itself because if you play two creation projects units are double buffed and then you get two warps to turn uh which is also insane and the other thing about creation project as far as all that goes is that if your opponent's not playing the like sort of relic volk cryptic master i don't know dean's chamber style of creation project uh, you know, you're packing, like, what, like, eight ways to kill relics in your deck for four things the opponent has to make relics? Like, is that a winning proposition? I mean, that's why, like, um, what is it? I don't know. This, I mean, it's, it's hard because you, you want to have enough ways to kill Creation Project, but then, like, 
they could either just not draw the project, in which case all those relic cards that you have are significantly weaker, or they just draw two of them, and you didn't draw two answers, and they get a slam agreement project anyways. Yeah, that's that's part of why I mentioned the two cards that I did, is because they do things other than just answer relics. Yeah. Um, I think and plays... I mean, End of the Era is, is actually going to solve all the creation projects if they have multiple in play. I mean, but this, yeah, this, you're right. If you if you're playing just like spot removal and they have more creation projects than you have removal, you're probably just going to lose. It's it's a crazy card. I mean, this is this is the card that's going to warp the meta. Uh, definitely. You know, there's there's this card, and then you know, I don't know what the throne's. Well, I guess we'll get we'll get to our throne assumptions there. But yeah, so the creation project again. You know, there's like right now there's like four different ways I can see a building creation project. You have the smallest way. You have the mid range way. You have the suppressing way, and you have like the Volk way, the relic way, and the Volk way can also be the suppressing way. So there's there's yeah. a lot of options here. One one more thing that I should mention is that uh, Agitator's Gavel is that right? That's the plus yeah. two plus two uh, amplify kill a relic. That might also be a pretty good uh, way of no doing gavel. It. Isn't gavel? Uh, Gravel's gavel? insight. Yes, gavel's insight. That's gavel's the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So like that trick out of a combo deck might be a reasonable way of dealing with it. Yeah, I think that's that's probably a good way because it it does a thing by itself, right? It's still a finest hour. Uh, in some sites, better because overwhelms, you know, could be relevant uh, as a trick, right? So yeah. I don't hate that. Um, okay. Yeah, so... I mean, like last last thrown open, I was playing for Gavel's Insight because um, uh, what was it? Dinosaur Nest was like mm -hmm. it was before the latest nerf or whatever. Um, it was in a lot of places and it was a problem for my deck. So like. That worked pretty well. Uh, and the creation project is better than Dinosaur Nest was uh, when <laughs> before it was nerfed. So, like, you know. Anyway, let's let's move on. Um, we'll, you know, uh, speculate about Throne later, shortly. <laughs> let's move on to another exciting uh, three faction card, but uh, perhaps not as powerful. Uh, three cost Summoner Solvent. It's a two-two. It costs Fire, Time, and Primal. When Summoner Solvent attacks, you may play a unit from your hand. And uh, if you charge it or give it killer, uh, you can get that effect immediately. Uh, so it seems like a pretty cool card. It's not obvi immediately obvious what its use will be. Um, Sternbless, do you have any good ideas for this one? I mean, there, there's a lot of interesting cases for it. I think there's... So my, my, my theory crafting at the moment is um, you, you could play like a mid-range style deck where you're playing Shashanka and like Heart of the Vaults, and you put like a Kairos in the market, where you're playing the sort of FTP mid-range strategy, and then if you have a Summoner Savant, it's sort of like a, the opponent has to kill it, or they die immediately, because you slam down like a Heart of the Vault, or a Shashanka, and then you just take over the board state. Um, or you can play it in the like, I'm going to super cheat out all the big stuff strategy, and play like a bunch more Nablers, in which case you're doing that sort of thing. I think you'd want to be playing at least one other way to cheat, um, because if you're playing just Summoner Savant as your only cheat code, it's inconsistent, right? So if you're playing Summoner Savant and Eccentric Officer, or Summoner Servant and World Pyre, I think that would be the way to go, right? You either want to put this sort of mid-range strategy, or using this as sort of like a giant big red threat that your opponent has to deal with, in which case you just play a regular game, or you're playing this entirely cheat-based strategy, you're playing, you know, 8 to 12 ways to cheat on power, uh, right? You know, World Pyre and Summoner Savant both can cheat things in, and you can maybe reach the critical mass of cheat effects. So that those that's sort of my two angles that I'm looking at Summer Savant. Or I don't know, it's like Spire Shadows. I don't know if Spire Shadows combines well with Summer Savant because I don't know how many units with small attack are worth cheating into play. But right, those are just, you know, you want to have eight ways to cheat at least, if not more, or a mid-range strategy. Yeah, I think I like your analysis. Yeah, the World Pirate seems like a good way. The Eccentric Officer is one that I hadn't thought of, but like that also seems like a good way. But I mean, I think these are pretty like, you know, niche gimmicky strategies that probably aren't good enough to be competitive. The, 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 it's possible they might have been. It's possibly still might be. It's just that like you know, creation project is just really absurd. <laughs> uh, I I don't know. I, I think the card. I think the mid range strategy is more likely to see uh, competitive status than the combo strategy. But again, I'm not an expert on combo decks, and it is, you know, it's always possible for someone to find the perfect storm of combo potential, right? Where they found the perfect puzzle pieces. And I think that those puzzle pieces could exist. It's not like one where I'm like, oh, it probably doesn't exist, but maybe someone will maybe get there. It, it's it's more likely than, um, 
than like zero. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm good with that. The almost in the narrows of the world. We'll figure out a way yes. to do something cool with this. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> the next card is a very weird one. Uh, it makes any, you know, person that likes menace factions and tesseracts cry. Uh, three fire primal shadow for a slow spell. Uh, ultimatum. The opponent must choose. You draw a card of your choice from their hand or transform eight random cards in their deck into fireballs. Fire bombs. So it basically says uh, transform eight random cards in the enemy deck into fire bombs, or if the enemy player is bad, they let you take a card out of their hand. Yeah, or if they have no cards in hand, right? Uh, they have no so, cards, and then they get the fire bombs no matter what. Yeah. So then, then oh, the, it's, so, it's automatic. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, this card is basically light the fuse, but better. Um, <laughs> or like the effect is light the fuse, but better. Uh, the card itself is probably light the fuse, but worse. I mean, I think. I mean, it would be nice if we had a nice, cool, like, Tesseract Brennan card in these factions, but, like, I think this card's fine to exist. You know, like, there's a subset of players that are, will want to have fun with it. I think that getting the Firebomb players, you know, the in the, uh, what is it, the Magic the Gathering player profiles of the world, the Johnnies, you know, giving a type of Johnny, the one that wants to just turn the enemy deck and do nothing but Firebombs and Scorpion Wasps. Let them have fun, I guess, you know. I, I, don't, I won't play with this card. It's not a spike card by any stretch, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. Yeah, I'm good with that as well. Okay, <laughs> factionless power. Star Charts uh, does not provide factions, but it is undepleted. It says, fate once per game. If you did not go first, create and draw a power burst. Um, interesting addition to the factionless deck, but I mean, I don't think the factionless deck is good. And uh, you have to be going second for this card to really do anything worthwhile. I mean, according to Direwolf, it's the first power card with fate in the entire game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just forgot about uh, the broken contract or whatever that card's called. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, this, so, so um, I, I'm not a big fan of this card. This is actually, I don't know if, if any, uh, I don't know how many of the listeners know, but this is actually the community card. Um, oh. Right. This was, this was a, uh, someone, someone made the design a card. I don't remember their name. They had a contest. And uh, Star Charts, I don't know if you know if Star Charts won or not. I don't think it did, but they might have submitted it anyways. Either way, this was a, uh, this was a community designer card, uh, which is interesting. Um, it's probably that, like, you know, if you're not going first, it's just a factionless power. So if you, you know, maybe if you have, like, super light influence, but even then it's kind of like, you, you know, if, you, if you're playing a deck that's play, that needs influence, right, that's not factionless, and you ever draw two of it, in your opening hand you're going to be like really sad so like maybe you could play this as a one of in a, like a very influenced light aggro strategy maybe uh, because you can get away with playing one of it and then sometimes have a go second you know shenanigans but you know that's just like super niche factionless decks get a little bit of a bone it's cute i don't like it very much that's fine i don't need to like every card yeah i think it's really only for the factionless decks it's just not having influence is such a huge cost. Uh, all right, and the last card in the set is Dean's Chamber. It costs two. It's a relic. It's factionless. Units can't use summon or contract abilities. So you were mentioning this with the creation project um, as a way of protecting it and then also playing your own bell axes as uh, two cost eight eights. Um, so obviously you think that this can see play. Uh, any other situations where you like the Dean's Chamber? Yeah, I think this cl the card's actually surprisingly playable, right? Uh, Grand Suppressor has a more powerful effect than might be expected. The problem with Grand Suppressor is, of course, you know, this thing not having stats is relevant, but Grand Suppressor having stats is also relevant because you can just torch Grand Suppressor and then you get the summon back. Uh, it's much harder to kill a relic than a unit, so if your goal is to hate things, to just really provide, you know, some lock pieces into place, this will be a much better lock than Grand Suppressor even if Grand Suppressor can attack and block. So I think this card is actually going to be pretty good. It's, you know, you, you send your opponent to detention, right? The Dean's like, you're in detention now! And then they can't do anything <laughs> anymore. Uh, so put their units in detention and lock them out of the game. Yeah, I mean, I've had problems dealing with opposing Grand Suppressor, and it usually comes down to having a removal spell for a unit. So, yeah, I like this card. It's just like... It's a, it's a powerful effect, for sure. And it can help enable your Bellax, right? 
Mm -hmm. And I suppose it can help enable, like, Guardian of Spring, or there's that, like, Thud Rock and Snooze or something that's, like, an 8-8 killer for 5 that has a drawback. Um, you really have to be enabling something with this card. I think you can't just slot it in a deck and expect it to do a lot of work. Um, but as, you know, we've discussed, there are ways of doing that. So, yeah, interesting card. Probably better than it looks. Okay, so that wraps up our card review. That is all... Uh, 24 cards from Enter the Arcanum and our thoughts on it, as, uh, along with um, some of the promos. So, uh, so Sunny, what do you think? So, we 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 have we now have a uh, throne format coming up, right? Yep. So, what do you think that the throne tournament's going to start looking like? <sighs> I think there's going to be a lot of the creation project. Um, yeah, I mean, before this set, I was super psyched about Skycrag, like, mid-range, because I thought that left Rhyme Marauder was going to be really good, but it turns out that deck's garbage against the Creation Project, as far as I can tell. But left Rhyme Marauder um, can deal with Creation Project, and with a form bend. All you do is yeah, give your opponent a 3-3 three, three, to yeah, go along with like, their other units. They like having that 3-3 three, three is the problem. Um, I mean, I think that Kira is going to be able to survive. I don't know what's changed since the last form. I did not play Kira in the last uh, Throne Open, and I don't remember why I didn't. I um, did. Because <laughs> I own, <laughs> apparently I just only play Kira these days. Yeah. I I mean, I've, I've been playing Kira recently, and it's like it's felt pretty good. Um, maybe people are just, like, more susceptible to a flying aggro, like, a flying uh, trick well, shot card, but... I mean, I mean, I feel like, as far as the Kira goes, is that, um, you know, it's gonna... I mean, the the uh, the established decks from the previous metagame are always gonna feel good on day one of a new metagame, because people are gonna be trying out new things, even in Creation Project, which is busted. You know, it'll take... Maybe it's already happened, but like it'll take some time to refine it a little bit, right? So that's true. Okay. Well, I think in any case, I do think that Kira is going to be a player, but only for you know a small subset of players <laughs> like like us. Um, you can play. You can probably still play Combray Aggro. That's why I played at the last open. That gets Gavel's Insight, which can deal with uh, uh, the Creation Project, and you can probably figure out other ways of making that deck well geared. Oh, um, what's the What's the one that cards can you can only play one uh, unit a turn? Uh, Umbre, Law, Mage. Law Mage or something. Yeah, Law yeah. Mage is also good versus uh, some versions of Creation Project. Not all of them, but it's yeah, good yeah. versus some of them. Yeah. So like, Combray Aggro is probably going to be reasonable. Stone Scar. Someone's always going to play Stone Scar. I've seen a bunch of uh, Onis recently. I don't love the deck, um, but getting a uh, Getting a gold-plated revolver on, I think it's Kazuo, the one that has Mastery 9. No, mm, the the Inspired Artist. Uh, it, Mastery 9? Yeah, Mastery 9 units and get, like, plus 4, plus 2. Units in your deck get plus 4, oh, plus 2. Oh, you, you mean, um... Uh... Akko or Akko, something? Akko, yes. Yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, so, like, that's an option. I mean, it's thrown. Like, people are going to play what they know, and there's a lot of options for it. There's also Combra Relics, Fury Control. These are options. I've seen Monero playing Rebuild Combo, which is super spicy, and I've lost to it a bunch, but I don't think it's going to be consistent enough. Um, shout out to Monero, always doing something exciting at the very least. So, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of options. I think you have to be very aware of the creation project because that's definitely going to show up. Um, so either have a good plan for it or don't be weak to the same things that the creation project is weak. That's that's my throne speculation. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. Um, I mean, it, it's it's somewhat hard to say because, again, creation project has... It, it's hard to know which version of the creation project will end up being the best one or if there will even be a sort of meta popular consensus on which one is the best one. Um, it's really, I mean, it really feels like it's going to be like creation project versus the world, uh, and we'll see who wins, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's that's what it feels like now, but yeah, I mean, that could also just be like blowing it out of proportion. A lot of people are trying yeah. the creation project right now. It's obviously very powerful, um, but, you know, 
when people are prepared for it, is it going to be as good as it feels like it is right now? And I don't know if that's the case. People are going to, you know, tune their decks just to have incidental hate against it. Like, you know, if you're if you're playing the cre creation project against Kira, like maybe it's doing pretty well. But what if Kira is playing Combre for for uh, the the Relicate Gavel's Insight card and uh, Combre Law Mage? Is it still really good? Maybe, but also maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I love that it's like it's like what what if what if Combray's playing a bunch of hate targeted to one specific decks? It could still be busted, but it might <laughs> finally be put in check. And it's like you're not really selling me on this whole, you know, creation project might be put in check, Sonny. Well, I mean, I've played I've played Combray Law Mage in Kira before. I've played so Gavel's Insight in aggressive Combray decks before. So like these are not necessarily cards that are only good against the new kid on the block they're reasonable options yeah that i know yeah, yeah. Have. That, that that's the thing right is that i think i think i just i just like the way you described it though was like <laughs> just like well what if the what if we play these specific cards that are specifically geared towards being good against one deck well maybe that deck is is not as good it's like <laughs> just made it seem like the deck was absurd sonny well, but on the other hand, we're all seeing right now how incredible uh, the creation project is, and we're all losing to it a bunch, right? <laughs> yeah. So, like, I mean, you just it. have to temper your expectations for how good that card is going to be a week and a day from now when during the tournament and when people have had time to adapt their lists. Mm -hmm. Maybe the solutions are ineffective, and it's still just as good as, as advertised. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it, it's... It's so hard to say, especially because, you know, there, again, there's a variety of creation project decks, and it's not like, it's like, oh, if it was like, oh, like with, you know, like Elysian uh, spell mid-range unit stuff, and like Kira, it's like, you know, you can configure Kira in a variety of different ways, but really it's going to be playing a similar game with or without Saviti, right? But it's like creation project, there's so many ways to build it, and that's good and bad. Um, also, just as indicated, the card's super powerful. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's... Yeah, I guess. I'm trying to compare it to, like, Xenon, because Xenon is a deck that has a lot of different um, flavors to it. Like, you could be going with some sacrifice effects with Huntmaster Vikram, or you could be going big with, like, uh, Twin Spiteling and Time Units, Time Influence, or you could be playing Reanimator or something. There are a lot of different ways to go for Xenon, but I guess there's not really, like, something that ties them all together, except maybe Exploit. Uh, the same way that the creation project is being is tying these cards together. The, the difference is that, like, with exploit, you can't answer exploit, right? You mm -hmm. just have your deck that's reasonably good against exploit. The creation project is a card that you actually have to answer most of the time. You can't just <laughs> ignore it or just be like, oh, my opponent played this. Oh, well, I guess I have to, you know, keep on going, which is the same way as exploit. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of, like, some sort of analogous version where a single card spawns a lot of different decks and i'm not really actually coming up with anything can you think of uh, a card that behaves in a similar way uh one card spawned a bunch of different decks um does torch count no because like it has to be something that you <laughs> yeah, yeah, need yeah. to answer right um i mean grodov stranger but that's still mm. it, it comes down way later yeah yeah, that's the thing, right? Um, I guess I guess let's let's look let's look at some other mini sets. Uh, okay, so here's something that we haven't mentioned: Creation Project Strangers, because you have the uh, three cost Fire Time Stranger that can kill opposing relics. <laughs> like, so if you get into a prolonged game, like you can do some cool stuff there. Are you really playing a? Th so, Sonny, you, you said you're like, oh, uh, what is it? The uh, the Pride Leader is too expensive because it costs four, and you're gonna play a card that costs three. That then you have to activate to cost like four. What's that card? What is what's that card? It's like it's the Gladiator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gladiator. You're paying a three cost unit that you then have to pay for exhaust to kill an enemy relic, and you think that my Pride Leader strategy is too slow? Well, the thing is, it's also like threatening. That card's a threatening card. It it makes it so that your cards in hand become really pumped up. This deck can also play its own creation project, oh, and then God. when you have Trader's Farm, those cards cost like your strangers all cost one less. 
Why why is it that the best creation project deck, the anti creation project, is also a deck that can play creation project? That's the funniest thing to me. Yeah. The best well, answers just... are also in faction. Yeah. Um, oh man, and you can even play uh what's the one that reduces I can't remember all the strangers' names. The one that reduces the top card of the cost of the top card by stranger. two. Yeah, yeah. So you play oh, creation and then project, has... you attack. You have you have Grodoff Stranger on top of your deck that got warp, and you can play it on curve on turn four. Thing is, <sighs> that doesn't really work because you draw a card first, and then the top card gets warp. So no, you attack like after you draw the card, then you. Attack, oh, okay, I see. I see. Two. You attack, and then the warp card is cheaper. Sure. No, that would yeah. make sense. Yeah. No, that would work. That would work, Sunny. I hate it, but it would work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Am I playing? Am I playing five faction strangers? For the tournament. Well, if you're playing Five Avengers, you know you get you get display of knowledge, so you can tutor up Creation Project. <laughs> it's also insurance against the Kira decks that are going in with a uh, something that trickshot ruffian. You know, you know, you, it's funny about the uh, you could you could play five faction seventy five Creation Projects. <laughs> you could just play like, all the tutor effects, and then what do you do with Creation Project once you tutor it out? I don't know. Draw more Creation Projects. <laughs> Oh my god. Okay, so yes, uh, let's, Anyways, let's wrap it up here. Yeah, we're kind of losing um, the trade of... Uh, the creation trade Project of... is a really powerful yeah. card. Either have an, a plan for it or playing it. That, I think that's the that's this format in a nutshell. And, and it's really a shame, because I think that I really liked the format before Creation Project, and now I really don't like it. So, yeah, that's where I am with it. We'll see. We'll see. It could it could turn out better, but yeah, I'm... I'm... I'm worried. I'm very worried about uh, what's going on. <laughs> yeah. A big thank you to all of our patrons that are somehow still supporting us, even though we've been super irregular as of late. Um, but a shout out to uh, Telmokos, Odsos, Prewebin, Work Done Sun, and Chrissier for their continued support of EpiCast. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, and that will be it. Uh, we'll probably see you the next time we are super inspired to make a podcast whenever that is uh probably if when new cards come out that seems to be the most inspired that we get um but uh good luck in the throne open if you're playing until then uh we will see you in the friend zone see ya